The ongoing COVID-19 threat, buying a ticket to just about any upcoming event is a pretty unsettling experience. You're not actually sure if what you're buying or paying for will be there in another week or so. Cancellations of events has grown increasingly frequent in recent days. Global events like the Australian Formula One Grand Prix have now been affected. Now, governments are working to tackle the spread, of, uh, the spread by flagging the prospect of bans on mass gatherings. So where exactly do you stand after cancellations and what sort of legal issues might you run into? Let's explore that in a bit more detail. Elizabeth Lenjo is a Kenyan advocate of the High Court. She's with me in studio right now. Um, this is, I guess, going to be a bit like legal class 101 because yeah. a couple of terms that we keep hearing coming up over and over again. Force majeure, what is it and how does it apply to public health emergencies? So force majeure is um, a clause that is provided in any contract. So for it to come in effect, it must be provided in a contract. And we're talking about what we call acts of God, quote unquote. That tsunamis, tornadoes, um, earthquakes, that sort of thing. Exactly. It could even cover issues of war, uh, anything unforeseeable that is not in control um, of, of the contracting parties. And there is no way that they can foresee it. Mm. Yeah. So there's a public health emergency of this nature. Does that fall under that definition? Ideally, it should, uh, but if it's not provided in a contract, then maybe we'd explore other ways of trying to cancel or invalidate a contract. So we'd probably be talking about frustration. Right, that's the other phrase that keeps coming up, frustration, because it's, as I understand it, it's a, it's a legal doctrine where one party to a contract is not able to, to meet their terms, their side of that contract, for reasons beyond their control. Exactly, and it means that uh, the performance of the contract would end up, uh, the result being what was not envisioned in a contract. So it definitely changes uh, the nature of the contract and the subject matter, so then it can actually be invalidated. But this is subject to a court, right? So it's not something that parties can So it's not that I, can can just, I, can, I can't just declare force majeure and that's it. Yeah, yeah you, you cannot. Will, the other parties to the contract has legal yes, recourse. Exactly, it's the same thing with, with frustration as well. It's left to the courts to interpret, and what then they will do is, uh, in the event of a force majeure clause, there would be assessing to what extent because a force majeure clause also you have to uh, be very specific so you cannot be too blanket when you're too blanket then it can be challenged mm -hmm. yeah so because ultimately this uh, the weird part about this is how then does this have ripple effects down the line so for instance like in the last 72 hours even today for instance the London Marathon completely cancelled the Australian GP cancelled literally just before first practice started but if you're then asking say for instance someone who's paid for access to the streaming service for Formula One in mm -hmm. a completely different market and yet Formula One is saying look it's not our problem we can't give you a race because we've suspended the race can someone on this end of the world then turn around and say well okay you're not meeting your obligations give me my money back they could try, uh, but then how do you try? What is the mechanism? Yeah. Then in this situation, we're talking about also conflict of laws. So then, are you going to sue under, you know, Abu Dhabi, Qatari laws, or Kenyan laws? Like it becomes a whole new <laughs> situation, and right? And because supply chains are so interconnected across the world, that becomes even more problematic. Exactly. Yeah. Right. With the digital age, things are very unpredictable. Okay. So moving forward, though, because this also does have implications on on how companies treat employees, right? Because if I can't provide a service, that means money's not coming through the door. What then changes as far as my obligations to my employees are concerned? Because just looking at Kenyan employment law, for instance, we're only entitled to seven days of sick leave in, any, in a 12-month window at full pay, another seven days at half pay. But this is a situation where people could be in hospital for weeks, months. How, how do systems cope with a pandemic like this? I think we need to figure out a better way because uh, when you look at countries like Mauritius, for example, very monsoon prone, but they have infrastructure in terms of policy to make sure then uh, the employees are well compensated and they figure out how they will work offline or online, you know, depending on the situation. So we need to be more robust with our laws. Uh, when we look at the last 10 years, there's been an epidemic here and there, you know, uh, it's either been SARS or Ebola, right? So I think we're at we are that place where we now really need to be very uh, deliberate with our laws. Uh, because Ken, historically Kenya hasn't had an epidemic, so we've never really had to prep for any of this. Yeah, but you see with our interaction with the international community, it's time for us to start being more pragmatic with how we approach the law. All right, we'll leave it there for the time being. Liz Lenjo, thank you very much for your time.